elephant in the room. You know, something we all know is there, but we don't really talk about it. We just kind of pretend it's not there. So we've been talking about diversity for a long time, ethnic diversity and gender diversity and income diversity and lots of others, actually. And those are all important conversations. But we haven't known how to talk about generational diversity. And it's just as real as races and genders. And, you know, like flying to another country, you get off that airplane, you know, you're going to have to work at connecting with people in China, let's say, because they have a different language, they have different customs, they have different values. Bingo. If I work with a 22-year-old and I'm 62, and I am, it's like a cross-cultural interaction. Now, I got to work at it. It's not impossible, but I got to work at it. And I think I found too many people saying, ah, kids today. And we got to stop saying that and say, we need to say kids today. Um, I know one high school principal. I love how she does this. She said, most high schoolers Mm -hmm. say, gotcha. She says, I say, gotcha. Mm -hmm. I'm going to catch you. So That's what we've got to do as employers, as so coaches, good. as teachers, as moms and dads. So, Chad, there's seven different generations alive right now on Earth. Wow. For the first time in modern history. Wow. People are living longer and you're having, you guys have babies <laughs> in your own house. I know. As but a Gen I'm, Xer, too. As yeah, a Gen that, Xer. That's right, yeah. <laughs> so, the fun thing is we can have fun trying to understand each other, but we got to do the work. And that's, yeah. this book was designed to be an encyclopedia. I, it's a reference book. I can read chapter seven. Ah, no one of my kids do that. I can read chapter four. Oh, no one of my grandpa does yeah. that. So I think it's going to be helpful for teams to collaborate that's instead good. of collide, but also families. So I'll stop there. It's so good. And yeah. and I know that's a little bit of wet the appetite for you guys tuning in. And uh, you're going to want to lean in and, and learn more here from Tim. And you'll hear from him actually talk a little bit more on some of the graphs and charts in here that I think are going to be extremely helpful for each of you. So again, I want to pause right here. And I want to tell you, Go to newdiversitybook.com. Yep. That's a site, newdiversitybook.com. Our team's going to put it in the chat here. And on that site, there's actually some really, really cool bonus features on the site, one of which is an assessment, which yep. I don't want to give that way because that's leading to my, ne- my next question here. But there's also, if you buy the book, you will get a full keynote copy yeah. of your talk on a new kind of diversity. Yeah, so, a video where they can watch it, share right. it, yeah. share it. Put it in front of their team. Yeah. Do a study around the book for each yeah. person, a mastermind or a small group yeah. with them. We'd love for you guys to do that. And so that's available. Just yeah. go to newdiversitybook.com to check all that out. But yeah. I do want to give you the second question, which okay. talks all about right. the assessment, because I think it's yeah. pretty cool. What, what a unique name, too. Yeah. We talk about in, in uh, we talk about emotional intelligence. Yeah. We talk about intellectual intelligence. IQ and EQ. Yep. But you have developed a new <laughs> A new, a new one, which is generational quotient, generational yeah. assessment that you've yes. created for all this. T- tell us a little bit about this yeah. free resource, this generational assessment that people can use. Sure. So you'll love what we called it, gang. Uh, we call it the GQ. See what we did there? So it's your generational quotient. Uh, it helps you measure your fluency at connecting with different generations. So a lot of workplaces have four, maybe even five generations working yeah. together. And we do think differently. We often vote differently. We talk differently. So this will allow you to say, ooh, I'm, I'm pretty good with millennials, but not so good with Gen Z. Or I'm pretty good with boomers, but not with Gen X. And so they can take the test, 41 questions. And then at the end, they'll get a free report saying you're better with this than that. And then it gives you a few steps you can take to better connect with those ones you're not as, yep. as connected to. It's great. So how well do I know the boomer generation? Let me let yeah. me test myself yeah. to see if I know how to engage with them appropriately and yeah. really learn how to meet them and unify us together, which is great. So you can do all that at newdiversitybook.com. Check that out. And we'll even drop the assessment in here too for a direct link in the chat. So we're incredibly excited. Yeah. So we're going to jump in here and, and I'm really excited about our first guest. I know you are. I've alluded yeah. to this a little bit already, yeah. uh, but it's none other than Dr. John C. Maxwell. And recently, you guys had a sit down to talk about this content, this book, the years and legacy that you guys have together. And it's such a beautiful friendship yeah. and partnership. And I'm yeah. really excited for you and John to share this with our audience. Anything you want to say about John and setting up this time together? I feel like I owe so much of my life and career to John. He's done more than I can even say. But whenever we get together, we laugh a little bit. We learn a little bit. And so that's what we did when we had this conversation. Can't wait. So check it out. John, thank you for taking a couple of minutes and sitting down with me. We have sat down together for 40 years. years, I was just, I was still finishing college when we met. You were doing like a week long conference. I took notes like crazy. I still take notes. So I'm honored that you'd spend a couple of minutes to talk about this new book. Uh, It's it's my choice. It is 40 years 
It's, it's been a great journey, hasn't yeah. it? It's, and and I, I would just like to all your people to know, in the beginning, he wasn't very good. He just really wasn't. But my mentorship for you has just been so awesome. It changed everything. <laughs> and I am so proud of you. Literally, we just finished speaking uh, on, on a, a major simulcast. Yeah. And you did such a great job on, on the book, New Kind of Diversity. In, in fact, I was sitting by Mark Cole, and I, as you taught, the, the people were on the edge of their seat. They were, they were really leaning in. And I think they're really leaning in because it's such an important message today. Yeah. And, and there is nobody I know more qualified to teach it than you because you have spent your whole life, even when you were on my yeah. team, yeah. You, were, you, you were the college pastor. Yeah. And, right. and, and you've spent your whole life with high school kids and, and, and college kids. And you've studied. You've had a real desire to understand the difference between uh, uh, different yeah. generations and and how do we bridge those gaps? And I'm so excited a, a, about about this book. And I just I just want you to know I have a copy and I'm already reading through it right now oh, myself. Wow. I'm honored. That's yeah, so well, fun. I'm honored well, I um, before I jump into a couple of questions, I want to ask you. I feel like I owe my life to you. Uh, your fingerprints are all over me. So you have stock in any person I influence. It's it's I'm the I'm the Joshua. You're the Moses. Well, you know, if, well, thank you. Thank you. And I, I, I feel like a father to you and you know yeah, that, yeah. but, but you know, Tim, when I see you, when I see you come out with a book like this, yeah. it just makes me so proud because you know what this is? This is multiplication of my mentoring and my right. influence. Yeah. And, and, and of course, you know, this subject much better than I do, but one of the beautiful things of mentoring people is that they expand the, the mentor gets expanded as far as influence and you have touched people that I would have never touched and helped them. And so I'm really proud of you. And I'm really proud of the book. It's, it's really a good book. Let me tell you something. You're getting better as a writer. I mean, well, you, thanks. you, 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 yeah, you, you, it's very obvious that you're going. So I love the book and you, the people today loved hearing you talk about diversity. Well, fine. It was fun. Yeah, it was a lot. So I got a couple of questions. You have said before that you'd like to become a millennial, meaning a next gen person. Talk about that. And what do you see in the emerging generations? What well, have you done to kind of learn? about? Well, that? first of all, I like to become a millennial because I'm 75. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> Say no more. Yeah, I mean, I, I can go back a, a few decades. Yes. And, and, you know, I, uh, the number one question I'm asked in the corporate world, and, and the way they ask the question, Tim, you'll get a kick out of this. The way they ask the question is the rich hand. Yes. How do I handle millennials? Yeah. So yeah, the very question tells me they're already negative yeah. about the yes, millennials. That's right. And and what I share with them is, is very simple. You don't handle anybody yeah. until you value them first. And I think the missing the missing link is the fact that we just kind of have to think that our generation is the best generation or the last generation. Yeah. Yeah. great. And one of the things I decide, even as an old person, is I'm I'm never going to kind of feel like after I die, everything goes to hell. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and so I tell, I tell in the corporate space, I say, the first thing you do is you just value them. Yeah. Because they're going to bring people to the table, really, and ideas to the table that you really need. And, uh, you know, some of my best thinking has been, been done by others. But my best thinking hasn't been by, done by others that think like me. Yeah, right. It's, it's been done by others who... Are different than me and are diverse and, and have different backgrounds and therefore their perspective is better. And, and we're just better together. Yeah. We're better together. Yeah. And I just feel that um, I would like to be a millennial because uh, my generation didn't put a cause or a mission yeah. above the dollar. We basically said, yeah. I know I may do mission someday, yeah. but right now, could I have some bucks? Yeah. And, and when you look at the millennial and, you know, they, they you know, they, they don't want every six month review. They really like to have a, a coach and they'd like to have somebody yeah. that would go along. So when I started studying millennials and I don't know them near like you, but after I studied and saw some of the great characteristics, yeah. I said, I basically said, yeah, I think I, I think I'm a, I think I'm yeah. a millennial yeah. in yeah. heart. So, but what I love about you is there's some people that can say, okay, th these are the different, these are the different yeah. groups, different generations. And, and so we get knowledge what I like about what you do and what I like about what you do in this book is you tell us not only the differences, but then you tell us how to take those differences and make them a strength in our organization yeah, yeah. And, and how those differences are going to add value. So you have answers. Yeah. A lot of times people just kind of expose the issue yeah. or the problem, mm -hmm. but you go, you say, no, and let me tell you now how to take yeah. these different people and diverse people and really 
um, bring them together and and have a better team. And so I just, yeah, I, I I just I just love you know when this is a long time ago. Well, not a long time, fifteen years ago, when Angela Arntz was the CEO of Burberry. Yeah, she took over an organization and a company that was going down. Yeah, and she realized old clothes, old people, old thinking. Yeah. And, you know, all of her board was 50, 60, 70. Yeah. And, and it, Angela got a board between, she said, I'm going to get a new board. Yeah. And she got a board between 25 and, and 35, 40, right in that range. And she said, you're going to now be our vision. You're going to help us. And, and she took the older board members and said, now you're going to be mentors yeah. and advisors and, and, you know, share out of your wisdom and experience. And she turned the company around, but she turned the company around. By going to a different generation yeah. with different thinking and empowering them, and empower yeah. them, and and look what happened to them. I, it's, it's, I think it's, it's a I think it's a great example of yeah, of, it is. She is perfect. She's the reverse mentoring yeah. queen, I think. So, totally. well, I really did go after. Um, I like to use the word pracademic. This is research based, but I do want to offer practical ideas on how to take steps, and I I feel like that's that's what we need to do, particularly with Prac- social science. Pracademic. Pracademic. We made up the word, but. I, I love that. I made up a word the other day too. Remarkableize. I said you need oh. to remarkableize things. You, oh, you need like to pracademic things. See, it's yeah. not a word. Yeah. But can I tell you something? It's going to be a word because a concept. how does yeah. a word become a word? Somebody has to say it. Yeah. That's what I tell people that's all true. the time. When that's they say it's not true. a word, that's that doesn't stop you that's or me. Right. Huh? <laughs> we, 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 exactly because right. it, it can't be a word until somebody says it and somebody says, I think that's a word. Yeah. So you, you know, because the people are with us today on this webinar. Two new potential words. Did you learn? Remember when I wrote my book on teamwork? I had the law of accountability. And yes. publisher said, well, there's no such yeah. word as accountability. I said, well, let's not th- let that stop us. Right. Let's make it a word. And it's now a word. It's, it is it, now. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to have, you know, remarkable license. Why, what was it? Pracademic. Pracademic. See, yeah. Yeah. you're a little smarter than me. I, no. uh, <laughs> remarkable license. Pracademic. So this is called a new kind of diversity, and it's about generational diversity. You have a lot of wisdom about just diverse teams, age, gender, sure. race. Talk about what leaders need to understand about diversity to make a team really collaborate rather than collide. I was talking to a group of um, major uh, leaders in Latin America about a year ago. And uh, if, if I took the uh, amount of people that I, I suppose there were maybe 30 leaders in the room, it would be. No exaggeration to say that those leaders led at least 50 million people. Mm. Wow. So, so big boys, yeah. big li- girls, big yeah. leaders. And I asked them, I said, and, and highly successful, highly successful in all kinds of walks of life. I mean, they were leaders. I had people in their companies, et cetera. Some of them were presidents of countries. I mean, and, and I said to them, how are you going to now take your potential and just exponentially Increase it. Yeah. Yeah. Because honestly, you're already successful and you already understand success principles and you already you you work hard and you've got all you got it all going for you. So how are you going to now all of a sudden compound your influence? How are you going to and, and the answer is partnerships? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You you see, if I know what I know, but I, I don't include you and you know what you know, but you don't include me, we we become silos. And so I, I hit my potential. But the moment that I say, hey, Tim, let, let's work together. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, everybody you influence comes yeah. with me and everybody right. I influence comes with you. And all of a sudden, we, we very quickly expanded our, 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 our level, our size yeah. of influence. Does that make sense? No doubt. And so what I tell people all the time is when you think of partnerships, when you think of diversity, when you think of different generations, every time you bring people that are different than you, yeah. you bring people into your influence that don't even know who you are. Yeah, it's true. And yeah. all of a sudden they come and they bring their influence, they bring yeah. their ideas, yeah. they bring their relationships, and you begin to compound yourself greatly. So I I have never understood somebody that says, well, you know, I've just, well, you've heard the expression, I'm a self-made man. When everybody tells yeah. me, Tim, they're a self-made man, I always look at them and say, oh, I'm, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because if you made everything yourself, you can't really have made that yeah. much. I mean, right. If you're going to climb Mount Everest, mm-hmm. You got to have a team. That's you, right. no, nobody says, you know, I think I'll get my sneakers on, yeah. run up to the top, plant the flag, come down the bar. No, no, you got, you got to have a team. And I think when you talk about the value of, of diversity, the value of different generations, of different background, all of that basically says that when you include them, yeah. 
your level of influence, your, your level of return in life, whatever you're going for, is just going to increase. Yeah, I so believe that. I do too. Well, and we're kind of practicing that. Our we organizations are. merge in oh, together. I'm and, so excited. Yeah, I am too. I'm so excited because we do these values. But you, I mean, when I think of what you've done with Habitudes, you've been, you've been singing the same song. You just been, you just have a different choir. Yeah. yeah. And, and so when you come alongside of us with the high schools and, yeah. and, and the colleges, you just you just took us to a whole different level. Well, and vice versa. And and so but that's the way good yeah. partnerships are always win win. And when you bring in diversity, if it's a good if it's good partnership, it's always win. Yeah, I agree. Okay, one last question. You've got a new book coming out soon on communication. I can hardly wait to. You and Dan and I had a great oh. talk about it. It was so much fun. So, so it's the 17 laws of communication. It's the 16, but that's all right. Is it 16? Yeah, it was oh. seven. No, no, no. It's okay. No, no. It was <laughs> okay. it was 17 when we were together. Okay. Well, you and, and Dan, I remember we spent four days. We just yeah, had the best time. Yeah. And you you and Dan both helped me a lot. It was the 17 laws. Okay. It was out of our conversations when we pulled up and did that. So that emerged that, that, that I, mer- I, I merged to yeah, So there are yeah. 16. And okay. probably if I'd have spent a few more days with you, we'd have got to 15, yeah. 14. <laughs> this stinks. This yeah, stinks. Yeah. After all, I just say, you know, there's not one thing you need to know about communication. <laughs> it's a little 10 page leaflet here. <laughs> just, just it's reason. a brochure. It's a brochure. But enjoy. Enjoy. <laughs> well, okay. Seriously, back to the book. Laws of so, communication. Laws of communication. 16. Um, but who's counting? That's right. That's right. Communication is paramount with multiple generations, especially. Nuances are easier between two boomers. They're a little tougher with a baby boomer, a Gen Z, a millennial. Talk a little bit about the importance of communication with multiple generations. Well, first of all, you know, Warren Buffett said, if you want to, the the most important skill for success, if you want to make a lot of money or whatever you want to do, is is communication. And uh, nothing has ever significantly been done without a great communicator. Someone has to bring people together. Somebody has to cast vision. Somebody has to draw out the ideas from other yeah, people, yeah. which is all part of this communication part. So people ask me all the time, say, well, how can you, com- how can you communicate to people 50 years younger than you? And the first thing I tell them is I, I, I let everybody know that I don't know what they know that are 50 years. It, yeah. I, I, so I'm not here to be amazing to them. Yeah, yeah. But I am here to value them. Yeah. And I'm here to do two things, value them, and number two, let them see down the road. My experience and my success, yeah. I'm going to offer to them because you can either get your own experience, which is important, yeah. or you can learn from someone else's experience. Yeah. And I think that when I cross over in communication with different generations, when they know that you, they, that you really value them, yeah. And they know that you want to also listen to them. And, and, and mm-hmm. it's communications, a uh, yeah. uh, two-way street. It's not top-down. Then they really open up. And, and I think I have something to offer them. But I've never felt that I have something to offer them and they have nothing to offer me. Mm-hmm. So I think great communication is valuing people and understanding that it's a two-way street. Yeah, I love that. John, I owe so much of my life to you. You have been the mentor for me. I love you. I'm going for next generation, but thanks for being a part of this today. And thanks for making this resource valuable and helpful. I love you. And I'm so glad we, I'm so glad we get to do it together. Really. Yeah, uh, you, you're you. just, you're a, a very, you're a very special friend. You're like a son to me. So uh, let's continue to help people. Okay. I'm going to hang around for quite a few years. I hope you can stay with yeah, me. I do too. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I love you. Such an incredible interview, Tim. And thank you and John again for yeah. blessing this audience with that that content and context. And I love seeing, again, just the relationship you guys have been able to form yeah. and the value we've been able to add, add to you in this this call. So thank you again for tu- tuning in. But we're going to dive a little deeper into yeah. the content yeah. right now. And this is where I would know, Tim, let's share a little bit about the book. Give okay. this this audience a, a teaser yeah. of what what's to come and the value that this can provide to them as well as to the teams they lead. Okay. So listeners, we thought it would be fun rather than me just give you a lecture or a talk. Um, I'm going to dialogue with you, yep, Chad, sure. and you all can listen in. I'll, I'll look at you from time to time, but I wanted to make this a conversation because it really is. This book is a conversation starter. Uh, we have old and young working together. We have old and young living together. Sometimes we don't get each other. And you know what I've noticed, Chad? Sometimes we think the goal is just to 
tolerate yeah. each other just to endure those millennials or whatever. So let's talk. You and I are different generations. Yep. yep. Uh, boomer and Gen X. That's yeah, right. That's and right. John is a boomer, same generation, but he's an early boomer. I'm a late boomer, yep. not a late bloomer, but a late <laughs> boomer. Okay. Let me just say that. Clarification okay. is key. So just in case you're tuning in and you're hearing about this yeah. for the very first time, the summary of the book is basically this. The book enables the reader to understand, empathize with, and leverage the strengths of the various generations on your team. So if you're with multiple generations on a team and you have noticed a little conflict yeah. instead of instead of collaboration, uh, this book is meant to be that reference guide. So Chad, I, I think you've noticed this, but there is a bit of a banter and a war on social media right now. Yes, just, um, just a little bit. Just a little just bit, a yeah. Little bit. I think it started fun and yeah. then became a little bit mean-spirited. So some of the war on social media, the hashtags, yep. about five or six years ago, we started seeing hashtag how to confuse a millennial. Mm. So that was us boomers making yep. fun of those young whippersnappers that didn't know what a payphone was, you know, or whatever, you know, that sort of thing, as if they had to know what that was, you know. But then the millennials started striking back. They did hashtag OK Boomer. And that was a big thing. I mean, three years ago or so, yep. I remember seeing that all over the place. And much of the accusations were pretty right. accurate. We didn't know what we were doing about some of the young stuff. Yep. Okay. But then Gen Z got involved. So Generation Z would be younger than the millennials. Mm -hmm. Okay. They're the new professionals now. They're also in high school and middle school, but they did hashtag okay, Karen. So oh, you I probably, remember, heard, yeah. This. So Karen yep. is that fictitious yep. figure, that mom who's always asking for the manager at the restaurant, you know, to tell them how to run the restaurant or always intruding on the high school principal, yep. telling him how to run his school. So they were just saying, oh, mom, stop it. You know, that mm -hmm. sort of thing. But then Gen Z started doing uh, poking at millennials and it was hashtag doggo. Mm -hmm. So you can look that up and see what Gen Z is saying yep. about the millennials who are only one generation ahead of them, mm -hmm. but they still, you know, you're cool, but we're cooler, yep. you know, that sort of thing. And then I thought one in very poor taste started coming out the last two years millennials and Gen Zers were poking at us boomers with hashtag boomer remover. And it was a reference to COVID-19, oh, <laughs> which is terrible. Oh, I know, terrible. But the point is, this tells you, social media reflects yes. what's happening in culture. Very much so. There is a thing out there called generational diversity. Mm -hmm. We don't call it that. We don't know what to do with it, except yeah. punk fun at each other. And I'm just saying, what could happen in, if instead of collision, there was collaboration? Good. So there is a widening Good. gap. You probably have yep. seen this. You have there, there's several at Maxwell Leadership. There's several growing leaders mm -hmm. that we got to figure this out. And yep. when we do, isn't it cool? You see strengths in the twenty yep. somethings, thirties, forty somethings. Big I don't time. know if you have anything to say about that, but yep. it's amazing to find strengths in in all the different generations. Oh, I love it. And it's it's a it's a unification message yeah. is what you're bringing to the table yeah, that's here. Right. Because if we can understand the differences, but find the commonalities, but understand why we have the differences yeah. that changes everything the care the compassion yeah. how we engage and it's just it's just having those conversations which i know this book is really going to enlighten us and make yeah. us aware yes of, that's what the gq assessment does it's, yeah. it's awareness right awareness yeah. is so important here yeah it begins there anyway yeah. so one of the phrases i use in the book is context explains conduct mm -hmm. so if i learn the context of a 20 something oh of course you might think that way or vote that way or do that thing. It, look at the content. doesn't mean I agree with all everything, but at least I have understanding. That's, right. That's the number one challenge, I think, of leaders today. I don't even understand these people, yeah. but when I do, I can leverage them better. I learn from my own children every time I'm with them, if I let myself. Yeah. So the most fun part of the book that you keep saying, yeah. share that, share that, <laughs> yeah. share that. I, I put a two-page chart. It, it's like a centerfold in the book of just information, but it's two full pages of a generational yeah. chart where I allow you readers to compare and contrast you with other generations. Yeah. So should we do part of that chart? We should. Okay. And and this is the part that's probably my favorite, but it's also not just my favorite. I've seen you do keynotes on this. Yeah. And this is where everybody gets their phones out. Yeah. And, and it's cause, cause this yeah. chart is the magic of, of, yeah. of, of the crux of the books. There's yeah. so much more around it, but this yeah. is such a, a critical piece. I feel like it is too. This chart was more than 20 years in the making, lots of interviews, lots of research, yeah. lots of focus groups. But I feel like I came with something, came up with something that helps us understand. Now, keep in mind, it's so easy to stereotype. I know I've said that already. The goal is not to stereotype, but to understand. Yeah. The goal is not to stereotype, but to understand. Okay, so viewers, if you can see this, on the screen behind me, this black ribbon from left to right lists the five generations 
that still might be in the workforce today. And all of them have names, Chad, for a reason. Okay. There was a reason why social scientists said okay. these are baby boomers. These are Gen Xers. So let's banter let's and as we go through this. Okay. Real quick, we're just going to take a few minutes, but let's talk about the years that each of these generations were born because context explains conduct. Yep. So the builder generation right behind me would be the oldest generation that might still be working. Their past retirement years, they were born between 1929 and 1945. So they are beyond retirement. They're beyond 65. But here's what's cool. Uh, they, they're healthy enough. They may still want to mow the lawn or do maintenance around the office. They might still be the owner of the company, yep. but they're there. Okay. Many of them are still there. And they think very differently than the 20-somethings and 30-somethings. Uh, they were called the builder generation, Chad, because look at the years they were born. They built so much out of so little. They were resourceful and frugal, okay? Uh, the next generation was the baby boomers. Um, they were called baby boomers because their generation started in 1946, ended in 1964. There was a boom of babies right after World War II. When the soldiers came back, nine months later, I was a biology <laughs> major. The, the, yeah, the, the, these, that's these how that babies, works. That's right. <laughs> that's how it works, okay? 76.4 million people were born, and that affected wow. culture. Because wow. everybody paid attention to us boomers. They wanted our eventual yeah. dollar. So bo books and movies and television programs and Dr. Benjamin Spock said, don't spank us. We're little people. Let them, let them express themselves. Well, in the 60s, we expressed ourselves. Yep. So, okay. So that was the baby boomers. Next came the baby busters. This is your generation or Generation X, born between 1965 and 1982. Yep. What year were you born? 1978. You just you just gave away to this whole whole group of people my age, Dante. You, you, you see so the you see the grays though. Well, you I, see I do. Yeah. So you would be a Gen Xer, but yep. you would be what social scientists call a tweener. If you were born five years at the tail end of one generation or five years at the beginning yep. of another, you're going to adopt characteristics of both. You're, it's this is not a science, an exact science, mm -hmm. but it is a social science. It helps you understand. Just like you can't say all Democrats think alike or all Republicans think alike. But you see a, a yeah. sense, yep. this is what's true about generations. So you would be one of these. Now, you were first called baby busters because the first year of your generation's existence was the introduction, the public introduction of the birth control pill. So instead of a boom, it was a bust. Okay. Yeah. Millennials come next. Yep. Uh, we've been talking about millennials forever. Uh, these, are, these are basically the young professionals that were born in the 80s and 90s. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were called millennials because they would spend their entire adult life in the new millennium, yep. the 21st century. Okay. Uh, and then finally, you have Generation Z following Generation Y or the millennials. Yep. Uh, one historian calls them the homelanders because their generation started at about the same time as the Department of Homeland Security. So Gen Zers would only remember the 21st century, more or less. Yep. Some social scientists date them slightly earlier in their beginning, but I think that dawn of the new century, so much pivoted in our world. So what I thought might be fun to do first, Chad, you and I have talked about this a yep. million times, yep. so please forgive the no. redundancy. No, this is great. But let's Learn talk about the narrative that each generation brings with them as they move into the workforce, okay? I like to say as they move from backpack to briefcase, mm -hmm. all right? So for the builder generation, that would be my mom mm -hmm. and dad's generation, I gave them the life paradigm, be grateful you have a job. But look at the years. They were grateful they had a job. My dad is a perfect example. He just passed away at 90 in 2020. Wow. But the first decade of his life was the Great Depression. And then the next five years were World War II. So that was a day of resourcefulness yeah. and patriotism and frugality. Be frugal. Save that rubber band and plastic bag. We'll need it next year. You know, yep. save the wrapping paper at Christmas. Yep. Yes. We'll use it next year. Yep. It, you know, it's we'll retape it. You know, oh my gosh, my mom and dad, my mom, I love my mom. I miss her to this day. She would actually, we'd use our napkins at dinner time. Oh, yeah. She'd hang the napkins on the clothesline. We'd use them the next meal because they weren't that dirty. Oh, I, I mean, that's, that's my, my mom. It was my Your grandparents. grandparents. Yeah. yeah. And the same yeah. thing. I mean, like yeah. just so frugal and everything. They kept everything. I miss that generation. Yeah. And I love that gratitude, you know, yeah. uh, something funny. My dad clear into the 21st century said, be grateful you got a job. I said, dad, I started the company. Just be grateful. You've got that job. Okay. <laughs> um, so the baby boomers come next. Some of you watching must be baby boomers like me. Um, I gave us life paradigm. Uh, I deserve better. Mm -hmm. And there was a bit of entitlement back in the fifties yeah. and sixties only because we felt we deserved a better life yeah. than mom and dad had had. 
It was not a time of depression, but expansion. Xers come next. This is your generation. I gave you all the life paradigm. Keep it real. Keep it real. Okay. You were an authentic generation that was unplugged and don't tag us as anything. But um, the years you were growing up, at least your generation, Mm -hmm. Vietnam War, Watergate, the OPEC gas crisis was going on. We were waiting in lines at the gas station and the gas prices were high. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? History cycles through. I love what Mark Twain said. History doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Mm -hmm. And there's a rhyme right now, back to those hard times back then. Yeah. So keep it real. Millennials, I gave you all, if you're on the line now, I gave you all the life paradigm. Life is a cafeteria because you grew up in a time where there was digital customization. Uh, so cell phones, computers. So my two kids are an example of this. You know, Jonathan, you, you helped mentor Jonathan. So he's 30 years old right now. Um, both of my kids stopped buying compact discs to get their music years ago. Why would they buy a CD? There might be several songs I don't even like, but I get one song at a time. And for my own playlist, mixing and matching like a cafeteria, Uh, educational decisions this way. Many young millennials would go to three or four different colleges for one degree. And faith is like this, too. I've noticed this across the country from New York to California. A little bit of Jesus, a little bit of Confucius, a little bit of Oprah, a little bit of Buddha, you know, and they've mixed and matched. Gosh, Yeah, there's no one truth source. But, you know, I figured out what fits me. It's like a buffet. Gosh. So anyway, and by the way, I hope that doesn't sound derogatory, but you know, we're a free agent. Yep. We're a free agent now. There's loyalty. Well, many millennials would say the company wasn't loyal to me. Why should I be loyal to them? So that's the feeling. I, I imagine you guys online, the light bulb's coming on when you're hearing this, because it is for me. And I've heard this a few times, yeah, but yeah. but this this content, as you look through this, you're looking through the lens of your life and it, yeah. it's, it's good awareness for people. Yeah. To that's like minimally. It's yeah. just gives us understanding. Yeah, yeah. I love looking at this as a dad. Yeah. Cause I, my, my Man, daughter will so make good. some decisions I wouldn't have made that's and good. Pam and I will go, what? And then I remember the book. Yep. It's a reference book for me. That's right. For me. Saying. And I go, oh yeah, I wrote that. That's but anyway, the last one I want to go through real quick is generation Z. Many of you who are workers or employers would go, I don't understand those recent graduates today. I feel like after the focus groups I've done with middle school, high school, college students, and young professionals, the best phrase I would attach to them would be this one. I'm coping and hoping. Mm -hmm. So they're hopeful because they're young, but this is a very difficult time to be a new professional. There's a volatile economy. Who knows if it's going to be a recession or inflation? We don't know. Uh, is the job going to be available or do I need to do a gig or a side hustle? Because it may go away. So just know, if nothing else, we need to have empathy for Gen Z because it's just so a true. weird, a weird day. So true. Yeah. So now one thing I want to, yeah. you, you've heard me talk about this, but I want to hear you comment. If you look across there, you almost see a pendulum on a grandfather clock st- swinging back and forth. The builder generation was a generation of caution. Yep. The, the boomers, a generation of confidence. Yep. Gen X, back to caution. Millennials, back to confidence. Mm -hmm. And Gen Z, back to caution. So even in 10, 15 years, there might be a sway going on, even with young people. And we can't, we got to stop saying kids today, kids Uh, today. uh, You're going to feel different, but there's different for a different reason. Yeah. Well, and I married a millennial. Okay. So I, I have in my own home. The, the combination of, of those you got three generations to your house. Yeah, so I do with my kids yeah. too. So, yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's, I see the pendulum swinging yeah. and how I even fil- filter yeah. life that's right. versus how my, my wife filters. Yeah. Life. Right. That's true. It's, it's, You've told me that before. Yes, it's, it's a big difference, yeah. but, but it, this is so enlightening for me to have that context again. To, to, to One of the reasons that happens is because parents certainly affect how we're raised, but culture seeps in quicker than it did a hundred years ago. Hundred years ago, you had a family. The parents were the number one influence on the boys and girls outside of Uncle Fred and Aunt Minnie, you know. But today, we got a smart device. I'm getting affected by culture as a 15 year old, and Lord knows, you know, Mom knows about my Instagram account. She has no idea I have five Finsta accounts, fake Instagram, you know, where I've got personas I've developed about who I am, and yeah, welcome to the world of today. So. Okay. I know we need yep, to stop yep, lecturing, yep. but yep. let me do a couple of others. Yep, real quick. Go ahead. I think this is fun. Uh, many of you are leaders watching and m- uh, m- many of you are parents who are leading a home. Let's talk about attitude toward authority because kids today have far more agency and audacity than maybe 90 years ago. 
So the builder generation, their view of authority was respect them. For we baby boomers, it was replace them. <laughs> My generation just <laughs> decided to take over, and we did. And you're waiting for us to leave the earth now. Uh, for the Gen Xers, it was endure them. I think your generation said, man, we got to put up with these boneheads. Right. You know, let's go get a Starbucks. <laughs> for millennials, it's choose them because remember, they see life as a cafeteria. So um, I will talk to college, or I did a decade ago, talk to college students that would say, well, yeah, I have him as a professor, but he's not my mentor. And what they meant by that was, I have to take his class. I'm choosing the people that I let coach me. Um, but I'm telling you, Chad, for the Gen Zers, because they've grown up with a smartphone and they really don't need adults to get information right now, I think if they were honest with us, they would say about authority, not sure I need them. I don't know if I need so you, boss. I like now, they do need you, but you're going to get a feel sometimes it's like you don't. What do you this, I'm, I got the badge on. I don't care. I got a I got a smartphone and I've I've Googled you. In fact, I'll talk to college students and I'm noticing they're looking down at their phone. I think they might be on social media. No, they're fact checking me in the audience <laughs> as I'm teaching, you know? Okay, one more that's really right. fun, and then we'll stop yeah. and we can banter a little bit more. I love talking about this. And if you're in a business right now, this will be very, very mm. relevant for you. The market. Yeah. What is the market of consumers? that each gender generation represents as they become the chief buyer, as they're in a full-time job and they're buying and selling, okay? So back in time, let's go to the builders. The builder generation uh, introduced goods into the economy. We talk about selling goods today. Before builders, it was commodities. At dinner time, you might've grown your meal in the garden, okay? <clears throat> or killed the fatted uh, calf yeah. or whatever. Um, for, for these builder generation kids, as they became the adults, if it was birthday time for their children, for the first time, they could go to the store and get a Betty Crocker cake mix. Instant cake mixes were introduced in the late 30s and 40s. And so pow it was powder. You add two eggs and water and stir. So that was a good, okay? It was a processed commodity. Baby boomers come along and the boomers introduced the service economy. Now we buy and sell services as much as goods. In fact, in America, we've manufacturing has been shipped out to other countries, but we're selling... I will pay for a service. Wash my car for me. Yep. Change the oil in my car. My dad still turns over in his grave that I pay somebody to change they the oil in my car for you. Why don't you do, do that it, yourself? Do you know, that's right. My dad could take a car, a car apart and put it back together. I'm telling you. Okay. So at birthday time, a boomer growing up, mom now had the opportunity and the more the predisposition to go to Baskin Robbins or a bakery yep. and get a cake served up to her by a professional. Yep. Your name is scribbled in icing. It's served up by a professional, but we pay for services, okay? Mm -hmm. Your generation comes yep. along, Chad, and I believe you introduced to the economy, the experience economy. Mm -hmm. It's as if your generation yep. as buyers said, goods are not enough, services are not enough. I want an experience when I buy something. So, so I like to joke, but it's true. it's true. We all go to Starbucks for an experience. I would not pay that much money for a paper cup of coffee unless I walk in the feel, the look, this fragrance, the, you know, the smells, everything. It's I'm buying an experience. The Gen Xers are keeping Starbucks in business is what you're saying. I, I think so. I think so. And Disney. Seriously. You and will take your kids to Disney. That's right. It's a five century right. experience. Right. Yeah? Okay. You get it. So, so, okay. Let's go back to birthday yeah. time. Your generation might have gone to Chuck E. Cheese because we're 100%. Still, I'm telling you, the birthday cake is Love. not enough. No, let's put some entertainment around. That's right. A yeah. mouse, tokens, pizza, Absolutely. games. Love Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah, the right. only problem is that the germs that you came with. Well, I don't know. <laughs> I'm always the great reason. Don't go to Chuck E. Yeah, Cheese that's right. during COVID. I don't take my kids there. No, no, no. No, 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 no way. Or else you have a, you know, white wipes. That's okay. Right. So get this. Experience economy led the way to the millennials, which I call now the transformation economy. And I made this prediction, I'm not a prophet, but I made this prediction between 10 and 15 years ago. As millennials become the parent, and they are now, they would in essence want more for their child. Goods are not enough. Services are not enough. Experiences aren't even enough. I want an experience that transforms mm -hmm. us in the process. Mm -hmm. So birthday time, I started predicting years ago, might be an even bigger production mm -hmm. where a group comes over. Sets, puts up a set and puts on a educational experience that changes our life, mm. uh, a spiritual experience, a mathematical, a science experience. And I'm telling you, Chad, 10 minutes from my home, right. there's a billboard where there's a company that comes in a limo. Lord knows right. what it costs. And they're putting on this experience. But you get what I'm saying, don't you? Can you hear this now? 
with every generation, expectations go up. I'll pay more, but I expect more. Pastors, you better provide an experience that transforms them. Employers, you better provide an experience that transforms them. Now, the good news is it's doable, but we got to think differently than we did even 10, 20 years ago. So one last box. Uh, For Generation Z, this is a prediction because they're just now becoming the adults. But um, we are now in the sharing economy where I think their mindset is, I consume and create. Mm -hmm. I'm buying and selling all Mm -hmm. the time. So I might be a YouTube influencer. I might have created an app and I'm a millionaire at 25, uh, you know, that sort of thing. So think about it, consuming and creating. The sharing economy is now a very different world. The largest hotel company in the world owns no Hotels, Airbnb, the largest taxi service in the world, owns no cars, you know, Uber, Lyft. It's weird. So Gen Z would say, I don't need to own things. I share things. I buy things. And, so, you know, and it's just, it, it's just a different world. And I, I got to stop, but I'm just saying, so good. this is one reason we've got to understand the consumers and the creators in our yeah. generation, because we have different mindsets. So good. And if I mentioned take pictures. So if, if you are taking a picture right now, one thing I'll ask you to do is, if you post to social media to, to share it to the world, tag at Tim Elmore, tag at Maxwell Leadership, and tag at John C. Maxwell. Yeah. And we'd love yeah. to repost some of you guys and yeah. get, get this out there to the masses. And thanks for sharing if you do do that as well. So appreciate it. But this is so enlightening. Well, it's part of a chart. There's a bigger chart yep. that I really think that's in the book, the right? Started. And that, yeah. that's the, this, yeah. this is, the, this is yeah. the appetizer to the main meal. But you have to get the book. To get the full the full course two page spread yeah. that you put in there that is that even takes this a step deeper and obviously the book's gonna break down all of this in a yeah. in an application mindset of hey how now that I got this insight yeah. this know how understanding yeah. now I can go take the GQ assessment and actually test out a little bit yeah. better because I know yeah. people a little bit better yeah um, but but now let me go apply it and that's yeah. I know so much of what the book well and I have a so. chapter on the builders and the boomers and the extras and the, so take it each you individual. literally can just say this is an encyclopedia I'm sure. going to go chapter seven. I need to learn more about those Gen Z kids. So I, I feel like that's, but um, Chad, I love to show a photograph. Yep. So I'll stop lecturing now, but I love this photograph. My question for all of you viewing is, do you feel the gap? Do you feel the disconnect between generations? This is a classic <laughs> multi-generation this. photograph uh, right behind us. So anyway, we'll stop. There. I may have had that haircut. At one yeah, that's right. You probably so I, may, I may have, yeah. I may have been guilty of it. So uh, incredible insights. And again, we're, we're going to jump into the next part of this uh, webinar, but thank yeah. you, Tim, for this. Thank you for writing the book. Again, team, everyone viewing online, newdiversitybook.com, yeah. newdiversitybook.com. It's where you can get all the value add, check the assessment out, yeah. the, the keynote, as well as yeah. purchase the book yeah. through your own retail outlets. We also have it on our cart here through Maxwell yeah. Leadership. And yeah. so excited to share that with you guys. We live in a world struggling to understand itself. Differences everywhere appear to drive us further apart. But when we learn to communicate, diversity becomes our greatest strength. We've become much more powerful together than we ever could be apart. And now with five generations in the workforce, those differences offer you two options. Allow the gaps between the generations to hold you back or use their strengths to your competitive advantage. Introducing a new kind of diversity your guidebook for leveraging generational dynamics in the workplace. Dr. Tim Elmore has led the country's conversation on generational diversity for more than three decades. Tim offers insights to help combat loneliness in the workplace, improve communication, revenue, and team morale, and bring clarity around team values and priorities. Pick up your copy of A New Kind of Diversity today. Well, Tim, I know you and I both are incredibly excited yep. about this next special guest that may be uh, almost a household name to some of you tuning in. You're, many of you on this call today are actually family and part of our community. Uh, but for those that aren't, you're in for a treat. And she's going to talk to us a little bit about her perspective on this book, A New yeah. Kind of Diversity yeah. and the content of it. And uh, so we're excited to welcome to this call, Valerie Burton. Let's uh, put some in the yeah. chats here, some hand claps <laughs> and uh, welcome Hello. Valerie to the call. Valerie, good to see you. Good to see you today. Oh, it's good Thanks to for see joining you, us. Chad. And congratulations, Tim, on such a needed topic. I have not seen a book tackling this subject in this way. So I'm really excited 
about what people are going to learn and and how they're going to be able to use it. Awesome. Well, we're, we're truly honored to have you. For those that don't know who is on this call and who Valerie Burton is, you should, and you will after this, I promise. But uh, she's named one of the top 60 motivational speakers in America. She's the top 100 thought leaders in the field of personal development and leadership, featured on shows you all know, Today Show, The Oprah Magazine, The Dr. Oz Show, Essence, NPR, Los Angeles Times, and the list goes on and on and on. Valerie, again, thank you for being here. I know Tim has some questions that are burning in, in his heart <laughs> to share with you and get some of your wisdom and insight. And I know as well as all of our community turning in online right now, they are excited to hear from you too. So Tim, thanks for, for inviting yeah. her on with your influence Absolutely. and having her be a part of this time together. Valerie, I'm honored that you spent some time with us. Thank you. You are a stellar oh, individual. I'm yeah. glad to be a part of the conversation. Good. Well, I want to ask you some Gen X questions, okay? So you're All an right. extraordinary right. person, but you are a member. I shouldn't say but. And you're a member <laughs> of Generation <laughs> X. So we were even talking beforehand. You know, you felt like your generation was kind of sandwiched in, kind of in the shadow of the boomers. So your generation, maybe not you, but your generation grew up a little more skeptical. The times were a little bit more darker with Watergate and Vietnam and others. And uh, so your generation grew up in the shadow of those baby boomers that were gigantic. And so I want to ask you, when did it hit you that you have something to offer that you could be an extraordinary individual and not just be in the shadows of another generation before you? What would you say? You know, as as we were coming into adulthood, I didn't really have those thoughts so much. Like, I don't think of myself as part of the Vietnam era or or yeah. anything like that because I was born in 73. So, you know, it was like wrapping up. But my dad yes. served in the military and came in during that time. Um, I really think more of like the Berlin Wall coming down. I think yeah. of... Uh, the 80s were a good time to grow up. I, You know, but yeah. I was a latchkey kid. I did have that, that uh, piece of yarn with the key on it around my neck under my sweater so nobody could see it, you know, <laughs> with yeah, both yeah. my parents working. Um, so I think when I really noticed um, the the generational difference, which I think happens for all generations is, you know, early 20s when people start realizing, oh, this new generation is adult. And I um, had gotten out of grad school and I was in the marketing department at an accounting firm and I would read the Dallas Business Journal. And one day they had this article about how we were all slackers, this Gen X. And I hated yeah. the title because they labeled us X because I guess we were just generic. So they didn't even yeah. give us a name. Uh, <laughs> and so I wrote a letter yeah. to the editor. <laughs> and I was like, you know, the first president I remember was a peanut farmer from Plains, Georgia. And, yeah. you know, I, I don't even know all the stuff you guys are talking about, but we're not slackers and we're reading your newspaper. So, you know, maybe you could, Consider not insulting us all the time. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. And, and yeah, and and that was actually I found an awakening, you know, for some boomers. They they I got a, an invitation from the editor in chief to start writing a column because they realized, hey, we're not listening to these voices. Yeah. So yeah. I think it happens with every generation, and and as that generation starts to speak up and their voice is heard, people begin. I guess maybe giving them a bit more respect and start yeah. trying to learn who are they? Um, yeah. Because, you know, I think every generation gets called a slacker or there's something wrong with them, right? <laughs> no, you're exactly right. In fact, let me volley back. Dating clear back to Socrates. Socrates thought kids in his day were disrespectful to their parents. And I thought, oh my gosh, he could have written this last week, you know? But you were right. I'm so glad you said what you did. The X generation, Generation X, wanted to be called X because they didn't want to be tagged with anything. Don't call me a this or that or the other. And and so you're you're exactly right. But you had to prove that you weren't those slackers like those older journalists said you were. And you weren't <laughs> going to fit into the stereotypes that we had. And I'm, I'm thrilled that you brought that up because even though you're part of that demographic, you had to break out of a, a, a stereotype, which right. which we hate. So- and I'm an Xer along with you, Valerie. So everything you just said resonates big time. So it's I'm with you. <laughs> so I'm a baby boomer being surrounded by Xers. Is you that are, what you're saying? Exactly you're right. overwhelming me now. That's exactly right. Okay. So Valerie, I got another question. So you have become an expert on culture and specifically humility and resiliency, which are two incredible uh, competencies that you want in any organization. 
I think those are powerful for any generation. Would you yeah. talk about why they are so important to Gen Z, millennials, Xers, and boomers all together? Yeah, you know, I, I feel like I have a, a lot of empathy for, yeah, I, I feel like boomers really had to be resilient. When I look at how my yeah. parents grew up and the changes that happen in their yeah. time. I mean, my dad grew up in segregated schools. My mother helped integrate a school, which was not a pleasant experience. Um, I didn't have any of that experience. And then I look at millennials and Gen Z and, you know, coming along when, you know, the, the school shootings started happening and, and September 11th yeah. and the recession, like, you know, I feel like my generation is the last one that had these opportunities to just do better than our parents in a fairly simple fashion. Um, so the resiliency, I think, is more needed than ever. And I think some of these younger generations have just learned it by virtue of the things that were happening as they were growing up. Um, but with the cultural humility, which is a psychological term around not assuming that you understand people who yeah. have a different experience than you do. Yeah. And so having the humility to really listen, uh, to ask questions, to not be judgmental. Um, you know, a lot of times we talk about cultural competence, which is assuming that, you know, I I'm going to, we don't want to call it stereotyping, but this generation does this. And so I know all about them. Um, but instead, looking at people as individuals and knowing there's there are generalities, but let me really hear the heart of what people are saying and what their frustrations are and what their hopes are and have the humility to know that you know, maybe there are some experiences I can't quite understand, but yeah, I can listen yeah. and I yeah. can try to understand. And that's where you start opening up that communication. No doubt. And and, and be coming to this place where you can actually collaborate and get things done together and have respect for one another. Yeah. I think you're right. That's what every generation in the workforce is wanting. Old from young and young from old. So, so. The last question I want to ask you, I really look forward to asking this question of you. I want you to talk to us as Coach Valerie Burton, okay? So you've been coaching consistently for years, and you're extraordinary. I want you to talk about coaching as it relates to different generations. How? What tips would you have to coaching millennials, coaching Xers, coaching boomers? Do you change anything up? I love the concept of listening and respecting. That's just never going to go away. But talk about being a coach to the multiple generations and what makes coaching effective from your point of view. Well, first of all, thank you, Tim. I love coaching and coaching is really helping people move from where they are to where they yeah. want to be and to be able to navigate those challenges along the way. And one of the most important principles that makes coaching work is getting to have clarity about where you're wanting to go. Yeah. Right. So if you're working in an environment with multiple generations, the question is, what is your vision for working together? What is it yeah. that you want to see happen that isn't happening right now or hasn't been happening? That's the first question. When you can all agree on that, then the question becomes, well, what's getting in our way? Hmm. And what are our options for moving around that? Yeah. And how could I show up in a way that makes this easier for everyone? And so if, for example, you're a baby boomer, you could step back and go, yeah, I might feel like, you know, this younger person is not as respectful or they don't want to pay their dues. Yeah. But then get curious. Well, I wonder where that comes from. Or I wonder yeah. if it's possible that I am interpreting something in a way that I see it in my generation that they really aren't intending it. And if yeah. you're in a younger generation, same thing, Right. You can make the assumption based on what someone older has said that they mean something they don't mean. But what yeah. if you give people the benefit of the doubt? Most of the time, people do deserve that. Not, yeah. I'm not saying every person. We all know those people that you know, yeah. you're spot on. But I would say most people, especially in a work situation, aren't trying yeah. to make things worse. And ultimately yeah. don't want to go to work and be stressed out and frustrated and not like their coworkers. <laughs> so, People are coping as best they can. And if you if you really approach it from that perspective, you can start asking the kinds of questions that I just asked that really open you up to seeing things differently. And you become a leader in that situation who's able to help move the ball forward 
and overcome some of those challenges. I think you're spot on. And I love that general counsel to any generation. It's going to come back to that. So Valerie, thank you so, so much for your insight in this uh, time together. Appreciate it. Oh, I loved it. I could I could keep going. This subject is so good. <laughs> I, I, I believe it. Just grab onto it and, and really ask themselves, what is my role in my workplace? Yes. Yeah. To bridge the gap between these generations. We're yes. all in it, trying to move in that same direction. How can yeah. we do it better together? Yeah. Love it. Valerie, you're the ultimate coach. You're the ultimate gift to all of us and our community <laughs> online. I see so many people chiming in with some aha moments and comments that I know they're going to take and apply. So thank you again for carving out today to be a part on such a special day. I know for your good friend, Tim, and book launch day. And thank you for prioritizing this and making it possible. You're such a gift. And we look forward to doing more together. We may take you up. If you can talk on this all day, we may take you up on that. And so, <laughs> so be careful. Be careful what you offer. Be careful what you offer offer. That's funny. Thank I look you again, Valerie. To it. Thank awesome. you. <laughs> Thanks again. Thanks. You bet. Introducing a new kind of diversity, your guidebook for leveraging generational dynamics in the workplace. Dr. Tim Elmore has led the country's conversation on generational diversity for more than three decades. Pick up your copy of a new kind of diversity today. All right, guys, we are at that point in the webinar where we get to interact with some Q&A with you, Tim. So I'm excited about this. Many of you have already been putting some questions in the chat, and my team has been texting me those. So my, my phone's been going off, and I'm excited to dive into a few of these. The first one actually comes from Jake in Chicago, and he's a 21-year-old student in college, okay. and he's entering the workforce recently, and he's trying to actually now learn how to influence and lead up. Yeah. What does so that not look by like? position, not from position, yeah. but how do I lead up and influence up? Yeah. You know, I think the rules that govern that have not changed. I remember when I was 23, John Maxwell was my boss. Was he better than me? Yeah. Was he smarter than me? Yeah. Was he a better position? Yeah. But I, here's what I learned. One work ethic it's a love language of your boss. If you show I'm willing to to come in, do the work, maybe stay late. I know that's not politically correct, but but to come in early, stay late. I remember having an intern saying, can I get a key? And I thought, that's pretty arrogant. You want yeah. a key to the building? Well, I want to get her early. Oh, here's the key. You know, so that would be one sure. thing. Another, I think um, when you have ideas and you will have ideas as a 21-year-old that are not being done by the boomers and Xers in charge, share it with humility. Share it with respect. I know that's something you want as well, 21-year-old. But I'm telling you, whenever I had ideas for John, if I was humble and said, listen, I know you got a great thing going here. This might be, you know, that humility was, oh, of course, yeah, let's talk about this. So um, humility and respect are just gigantic. And then I would say, learn the love language of your boss. For John, for my boss early on, it was save me time. If I would do uh, write a chapter or write a lesson or do something for him, he'd write a thank you note back, handwritten every time. Still got a bunch of them. You just saved me nine and a half hours of my time. And I knew that was his way of saying, thanks for loving me. I love you too. So learn what speaks to them. And if you'll do that, if you'll add value in the way they need or want to have, you'll have a key to the building and yeah. more. So I'll that's, stop there. No, that's incredible too. Um, and this one comes from, because we're in a rapid fire here, please keep sending them in the chat. So teams text me as we go in real time. So please keep dropping those in the chat. But I got one. This one's coming from Dwayne in DC. Uh, what are the key questions leaders need to ask to be better at closing the generation gap that we talked oh, about? Good question. One that I suggest in the new kind of diversity book, which I'm sure you're going to be getting <laughs> soon. Uh, I'm, I'm kidding. No, I'm not kidding. No, you're I'm not, not kidding. I, I want you to get it. I hope it's a reference guide for things like this. That's I put this in the chapter. One, I think we need to ask those younger generation workers, uh, what's your superpower? Okay. And that's just a fun way of saying, where do you bring strengths? It may be something to do with smart technology or creating apps or whatever, but ask them that question. I think secondly, what can I do that would make you feel empowered? Mm. Even if you can't do everything they say, you just learned how, what their trigger is, yeah. you know? 
And it may be leave me alone, give me autonomy. It may be give me a lot of feedback daily. Uh, a lot of times the data shows, I shouldn't say a lot, in a nationwide survey of Generation Z, the workers said, I want full access to my boss and I'd like feedback on a daily basis. Well, most bosses would go, really? Seriously? Yeah. So that's good. almost like I'm playing a video game. Yeah, I want lots right. of feedback on yeah, that in real you know, time. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Let me see. Um, I think another one would be this communicates, this builds a bridge. If you're asking them questions so they get heard and you're listening. So I often say to bosses, the older folks, this is the leg you have to stand on, L-E-G. Listen, that makes them feel heard. Mm -hmm. Empathize, that makes them feel understood. And then guide. Now you've earned the right to guide them. Oh, say, say that again. Tim. Okay. Again. Listen, which makes them feel heard. Empathize, which makes them feel understood. Yeah. Now I've earned a lot, the right to G, guide. And when That's I good. guide, they go, yes. That's good. So it's just, it's really just good human relationship. Doesn't that work with spouses? Yes. yes. Our children? Yes. So that'd be so what good. I would recommend. That's incredible. I know everybody's taking notes down there. Uh, Thanks for putting and putting that in the chat too. I know we'll get that in the chat of what he just said on leg as well. But this one comes from Los Angeles. Preston in Los Angeles says, is the generation you are from the leading the leading factor in how you think? Oh, wow. Good question. So my answer would be not always. For some that are completely saturated into culture or whatever. I'm on TikTok, Instagram, and I spend eight hours a day on that. It might be. But I would be the first to admit, and I do in the book, there's other factors that are just as strong and maybe stronger. The parents who raised you, okay? Uh, family of orig origin, personality, yeah. uh, uh, tragic things that have happened that might have um, given you PTSD, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, so there are, are a lot of other factors. So I would say, no, it's not always the leading factor, but it's definitely a factor that I like to call it the elephant in the room, mm -hmm. the one we don't talk about. And the one we need to be talking about because there's so much we could glean from each other if we just get it out there in the open. So, That's good. yeah, very helpful. Very helpful. Well, this one comes from Carolina in Germany. So put in the chat your emoji flag in there if you're international. <laughs> there you if you're international, we want to see how much of an audience we have from all over the globe because I know we have that today. Please put that in there. So we love our international tribe. Uh, what are some of the most common things? that create discord between generations in the workplace? I think that's a big one. Yeah, yeah it is. So this may relate to your home. Uh, I'm imagining that some of you are listening and your parents. And so with one ear, you're listening as a professional. With the other, ear, you're listening as a parent. I know you've even told me sometimes I'm doing that. I, I am too. I've got two adult children, but they're millennials and I'm different. I love them to pieces, but I have to acknowledge we're a little different. So here would be one. If I insist on my own way, that's just going to cause them oftentimes to dig their heels in. Not all the time, yeah. but um, I think we need to meet in the middle. So when they come into the workplace, yeah, it's not a classroom, it's a workroom. Yeah. So we need to call them up to the majors, right? But at the same time, I need to be able to communicate. I want to come your way on this. So maybe we do text message more often, or maybe we do post some some uh, some items on Instagram instead of just our Slack, you know, team group uh, uh, communication. So that would be one. Uh, another one would be um, when I don't show respect, I'm going to have a difficult time on young and old. Yeah. Um, I tell the story of um, Janet and Rory, uh, who um, Janet was a hiring manager. She hired Rory. He's now 23, been on the job one year. They had a team meeting, Chad. And as Janet's sharing the strategies for the next quarter, he chuckles, kind of lacking respect. May I say that? And he, I don't think he meant to, but it's just he's chuckling at these stupid yeah. ideas. And of course, Janet goes, am I missing something, Roy? Is something funny? He goes, well, I think, I think what we're doing is pretty chuggy. Well, Janet didn't know what chuggy meant, but she knew it was derogatory. So she lets the meeting go, but she's, she's, she's put off. So after the meeting, she asked Roy to come to her office and they have a meeting short and sweet. Well, no, short and sour, I should say. Yeah. So Janet goes, you just disrespected me. You diss me. Uh, you question my authority in front of the you know, whole department. And he said, I feel like you diss me. You didn't listen. You said this was a learning organization. You said you're open to new ideas, but he didn't know how to share the ideas. Mm -hmm. So I think we've got to make sure that respect is universal and will not go away. 
I cannot imagine a time when showing respect to another generation doesn't go a long way. If my young team members have this wing nut, foul tip, bonehead idea, but they share it with respect, I'm going to go, well, let's think about it, you know, because of the way it was shared. You can say almost anything if you say it well, if you say it in the right way. And then one last thing. I believe that humility is just a magic wand. Uh, we do not live in a humble world right now. But if you remember, Chad, last year, I released a book called The Eight Paradoxes. Right. Yep. And the first paradox of the book of leadership is I should be confident and humble. Now, often those don't go together. But think about it. When I speak, I want to be confident. Uh, I think we're get, we get heard when we're confident. Yep. But at the same time, I want to be humble, which, I'm, which I think causes people to realize, okay, he didn't think he knows everything if he's humble. So let me give you my assignment that I gave me this year. When I speak, I want to speak as if I believe I'm right. But when I listen, I want to listen as if I believe I'm wrong. When I do that to a 20 son, when I do that to my own kids, they go, seriously, dad, you're an author and you're listening to me. You know, it just goes a long way. So good. So good. So much great insight here, guys. Uh, Let's see here. Just a couple more. Because uh, I know we're going to run out of time here, which I wish we get to all these questions that are that are coming in. Uh, this one says, actually, it's a John Maxwell fan, so this is good. Good one. Uh, John Maxwell has said before that managers treat everyone the same, and leaders treat everyone differently. Yeah. Tell me about this idea. So they've read some of your stuff, I think, yeah. too, Tim. Chess versus checkers in yeah. leadership, and how that that plays into the way leaders should treat others. And this yeah. comes from uh, Jody from Toronto, Canada, our international crowd again. Cool. Yay. Yeah. So if you're not familiar with chess and checkers, uh, let me just explain. Uh, we love to teach next generation leaders through images. Yeah. Um, we think pictures beat lectures every day. So, and pictures are worth a thousand words. So one of our images that we teach is called chess and checkers. The bottom line very quickly is when I play the game of checkers, all my pieces look alike, move alike, I treat them all alike. When I play the game of chess, I have to know what each piece can do. Mm -hmm. A knight does this, and a rook does this, and a pawn does this, and a bishop does this, and a queen does this. So um, I believe good leaders play chess, not checkers with their people. I find out who's in front of me, and I learn how to lead them best to get to the goal. So even my own two kids, two children born out of the same womb, eating the same green beans under the same roof, very different. So I disciplined my children differently based on who they were. And I remember one time Bethany came to me and said, dad, you're treating Jonathan differently than me. I said, Bethany, remember chess and checkers? And she goes, yeah, he's different. You know, <laughs> so, and yes, he is. You yes, mentored that kid. That's right. So um, I would just say, um, I think this might be a good time for a story, Chad. Yeah, do, uh, do, I know we have, we're yeah. short on time, but one of my favorite stories of a leader that played chess was at a quick service restaurant. So it's a fast food restaurant, great brand that we all know. But um, Maggie was the hiring manager. She interviews Antonio. Mm. He seems to be a good worker. He has some experience, seems to be committed to really coming in and doing the work. So she goes through all of the questions. Then she shares all the policies and hires him. Well, a few weeks into the job, Antonio's there. Maggie happens to be on the shift and notices a gigantic tattoo on his right arm. Well, one of the policies at this particular restaurant, right or wrong, no tattoos. We just feel like that's off-putting to some older customers. We want to look clean and sharp and so no tattoos. Well, he went to the interview and didn't say anything. So you can tell Maggie's a little upset. So she calls Antonio back to her office and this is where the rubber hit the road. She said, you didn't, you weren't honest with me. You need to, you have that tattoo and you shouldn't have that tattoo and be on the team here. Well, he got completely offended because that tattoo as a 20 something was part of his identity. But I mean, that tattoo, the piercing, as you well know, numerous, you know, young professionals have them. It's part of the right. So he felt like she was questioning his very identity. Mm -hmm. So they met three times and didn't make a lot of headway. But the fourth time, breakthrough. And here's why there was Maggie Ledwell. She, they, they met together alone in the back office. And she said, Antonio, I got to be honest with you. I can't just let this tattoo slide because everybody else has followed the policy. And if I let you go, I'm going to have, you know, I'm going to have all kinds of questioning of the policy and we're going to be in trouble with corporate. However, 
she said, you're a great worker. I don't want to lose you on the team. You're such a team leader already after just a few months. So let's make a deal. We're going to get in front of the whole team and talk this through in front of them. And the deal I want to make is uh, we're going to keep you as a great worker, but you're going to wear a long sleeve shirt and you're going to cover that tattoo. I know you're proud of it, but while you're here during this shift, you're committing and I need you to apologize if you can do it sincerely that you weren't honest up front. And he did it and she did it. The team gave him a standing ovation. I think that was chess, not checkers. If she had a different kind of person and he's not cooperative or not, you know, she would have gone bye bye. Yep. You know, he was worth keeping. And so she flexed without completely giving in. And then she called corporate and said, could we rethink yeah, this yeah, tattoo policy? This policy? You know, yeah. maybe we need to rethink yeah. this. Yeah. So, which is which yeah. is a great way to lead up to from her position and what she's experiencing yeah. in the field, too. Which yeah. Is, which is great. So, gosh, what an incredible story. So, all right, we'll wrap with this. We've got so many coming in, but we're going to, we're going to leave it at this, but I think it's a good one to wrap on. So uh, this is Dylan from Houston, Texas. Um, how does one get the most out of this new kind of diversity book? We've been talking about the book. Yeah, You'll get yeah. it. Uh, well, thanks for asking. Yeah. I'm very proud of it. I'm excited. It's not the end all book, but I tell you what, I've mentioned this already. I want it to be an encyclopedia, like a book you have on the shelf that you could refer to, chapter seven or three or eight. If you need to figure out this generation or that population or this group, or why did this question get asked? Or what's this DE&I feeling that I've got on my, in my, on my team? Well, here's the generational look. So that would be one. Read it for sure and use it as a reference guide. But I'd like to encourage you. This may sound horrible, but please forgive me. Get a copy for everybody on the team. Let them have their own reference guide because the young are going to need to understand the old and the old are going to need to understand the young. And then have a lunch and learn. Make this a discussion topic. We did this on our team and I did this, but but we're talking. We got Gen Z millennials. We're laughing together at each other and we're laughing at ourselves. And I go, I know I do that, don't I? So I'm poking fun at me. And they realize, okay, if you did that, I can do that. So I try to be a guide dog, not a guard dog. I'm not protecting. I'm partnering. I'm going first. So um, think bigger maybe than you're thinking. Get a copy, yes. Get a case maybe. And, um, and, and maybe make it a group study where you're talking and processing. And now we can talk about ethnic, gender, income diversity, and generational diversity. And it's not a weird elephant in the room. It's yeah. very good. And you'll see, I mean, on this screen, the, the tagline of the book is, making the different generations on your team a competitive advantage. This is a book that's really designed for team. Yeah, Just it really like is. Tim said, I mean, to have this as a book study with your team, take them through it together will be so applicable yeah. to this specific book. And that's not always the case. A lot of books are more for personal growth consumption, yeah. but this is for personal growth with a team, which yeah. I think is so important to, yeah. to narrow on. So, you, and you guys know the site, we put the link in there. I'll say it one more time, but newdiversitybook.com, newdiversitybook.com. You can get the GQ assessment on there. You can also get access to a new kind of diversity keynote that you're going to do yeah. by yeah, buying right. the book. And then you can buy it through all the retailers, including our Maxwell leadership cart as well. So Thank you again, Tim, for an incredible Q&A. Wasn't pleasure. that so great? Let's put a little applause emoji <laughs> in there again. So thank you, Tim. I re really My appreciate pleasure. that. It was fun. It was fun. We live in a world struggling to understand itself. Differences everywhere appear to drive us further apart. But when we learn to communicate, diversity becomes our greatest strength. We become much more powerful together than we ever could be apart. And now with five generations in the workforce, those differences offer you two options. Allow the gaps between the generations to hold you back or use their strengths to your competitive advantage.